Okay, so we'll make a right here onto Plains Road. All right, got it. And that hill up on our left is our destination. It mostly looks like woods around here. Mm -hmm. Not really much of a hill here in Haddam, Connecticut. No, no, there isn't much to it. It's mainly forest, a bunch of trails going through there. And I guess we could pull over, like, right here. All right, so what's the deal with this hill in Haddam? Ray, this hill is officially known as Cremation Hill. Because they say a farmer who used to own this land long ago used to murder farmhands up here and then burn the bodies to cover the crime. Hello, I'm Jeff Belanger. And I'm Ray Osher. Welcome to episode 284 of the New England Legends podcast. We're so glad you're with us on our mission to chronicle every legend in New England one story at a time. Did you know that most of our story leads come from you? This one did. Thanks to Leah Tomaszewski for the lead. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast because it's free anywhere you get your podcasts and reach out to us anytime through our website with your own tales of local strangeness. We're always on the hunt for haunts, monsters, odd history, true crime, roadside oddities, and anything else that's truly weird in our region. Now, before we explore the mystery of Cremation Hill, we want to take just a minute to tell you about our sponsor, New Audi Herbals. Ray, it's wintertime. Sure is. And Valentine's Day is coming up soon, which means it's the perfect time to get warm with some Share My Blanket Tea from Nuwadi Herbals. Share My Blanket Tea combines all natural ingredients designed to create sensual energy for lovers. Even the process of boiling the water, letting the tea steep, and then sitting down with your special someone shows you're making time for each other. You're warming up together, and in my experience... That leads to good things. Mm, that it does. <laughs> Plus, New Audi Herbals also offers a line of soaps, bath salts, bath bags, essential oils, and balms to create a spa experience at home. And because it's New Audi Herbals, you know these are all natural products made by hand. When you and your partner are relaxed, clean, smelling fresh, good things also tend to happen. So true. Be sure to make some time for your special someone all year round because great things happen when you share a cup of tea together. Let New Audi Herbals help support your healthy lifestyle. Check out the New Audi Herbals website to see all their great products and you get 20% off your order when you use the promo code LEGENDS20 at checkout. Visit NewAudiHerbals.com. That's N-U-W-A-T-I Herbals with an S dot com. All right, Jeff. Cremation Hill in Haddam, Connecticut. I take it there weren't funerals up here. (laughs) No, there weren't. Well, not in the sense that we think of funerals. There's this story that's been passed around these parts about this farmer who would hire farmhands for the season, and when the season was over, he wouldn't pay them. Instead, he'd murder them and burn the bodies. Oh my God, that's horrible. I guess that would be the cremation part of Cremation Hill. Right, which is the official name of the hill, by the way. But you know how sometimes you hear these stories and it turns out that's really not what happened? Yeah, like maybe there was a funeral home up here long ago and and that's how the hill got its name. Right. And and people made up the murder part because it's juicy. Yes, exactly. Not in this case. Now, beg your forgiveness for this one, but it turns out here on Cremation Hill, where there's smoke, there's also fire. Uh, I get it. (laughs) And a man hanged for this. So let's head back to 1921 and meet Emil Shoup. It's the spring of 1921 here in the Shalerville section of Haddam. We're standing by the farm of Emil Shute. There's a small shed nearby that advertises grain, hay, and feed supplies for sale here. The Shute family runs a small grocery store on the property, and there's a single gasoline pump out front where Shute sells gas to the increasing automobile traffic coming down the road in front of his farm. His house is set back a bit, and that's where Emil lives with his wife Marie and some of their seven sons. A little more background on Emil Schutt. He was born in Germany in 1867. He emigrated to New York when he was 20 years old. And in New York, he married another German immigrant named Marie. And the two had their first son there in 1898. In 1899, they moved to Haddam, Connecticut, where they purchased this farm. And this is where the other six boys were born. So we've got a whole family working this farm by 1920. That's right. And the other thing about Emil Schutt is that he isn't really well-liked. I mean, maybe it's because he's German and the whole world just fought a a war against Germany. You know, you can tell he works hard at hiding his German accent. I mean, he's been here in the United States for nearly 30 years at this point. But when he speaks, you can tell he's trying to blend in. Yeah, no, for sure. But you know, the more likely reason that shoot isn't liked is because he's mean. I mean, he doesn't treat his family well. They're scared of him. Plus, he's a shady character. 
He's been sued twice over land dealings where he was accused of selling land he didn't own or misrepresenting what he did have to sell. And in recent years, Emil moved a lot of property into his wife's name to protect himself from further lawsuits. And he's mean to his family, too? Yeah. I mean, when you see Marie shoot working in the store, she just seems petrified of her husband. And their son, Julius, was beaten so many times by his father that he joined the Navy as soon as he was of age. And his father's parting words to his son? Emil told Julius, go, and may the first bullet that comes along strike you dead. Wow, nice guy. Yeah. There's rumors about this nasty man. Now, people steer clear of him when they can. It's Wednesday, May 18th, when Emil Schutt's world starts to crumble. As we said before, he had transferred most of his land into his wife's name to protect himself from more lawsuits. Well, Emil wants her to sign some of that land back over to him. On the advice of her sons, Marie refuses. An argument gets heated, and Emil pulls a revolver on his wife. Marie runs for it. She runs down the street to her son, Walter's house. Now, when Walter hears what happened, he grabs his shotgun and runs back to his parents' house. Walter can see that his father is in a rage. Walter fires his shotgun over the head of his father, which sends his angry dad back inside. The police soon arrive, and Emil's family has him arrested. Once Emil is safely behind bars, his sons finally feel safe enough to tell police more information about their father. And that's when the house of cards crumbles. Shoot's sons offer police a tip that they'll find something bad near the top of the hill of the Shoot's farm property. Police hike up the hill, and there they find a brush pile that had been burned. When they begin to sift around the ashes, they discover some buttons, a buckle, and then human bones. After analysis, it seems the fire was set by kerosene. And pretty soon, the connection is made between those remains and a French-Canadian farmhand named Denis Leduc. Three of the Shute brothers testify that they had seen their father in Leduc arguing on the night of April 21st. The following morning, one of the Shute boys claimed he saw Leduc with a hole in his skull and that his brains were pulsating through the hole. Oh. Marie Shute dressed his wounds. Then Denis Leduc rested in his cot in the barn. The following morning, he was found dead. Now, calling the police felt like a bad idea. So Shoot burned the remains in a brush fire. The motive? Shoot owed Leduc $100 for a season's work, and he didn't want to pay it. That's terrible. And only the beginning. Back in 1915, the entire Ball family, three members, died in a nearby house fire. Their death was ruled asphyxiation, but the Shoot brothers told police this was no accident. So authorities drive over to the Haddam Cemetery and exhume the three bodies of the Ball family. They find bullets in the bodies. That's when Julius Shue testifies that in the early morning hours of December 10th, 1915, he and his father walk less than a mile from their home to a shack where the Balls lived. Julius was told to carry a 38 caliber rifle and an oil can. His father brought a shotgun and kindling wood. Once at the house, Emil soaked the wood in oil and told his son to light a fire at the back door. As the fire grew and smoke filled the house, soon screams were heard coming from inside. First, Mrs. Ball raced out the front door to escape the fire. But she was greeted by Emil, who shot her dead. Next, 18-year-old Jacob Ball comes running out with a pistol in his hand. Emil shot Jacob. And finally, when Joseph Ball ran around the house looking for the fire, he too was shot by Emil. But 18-year-old Jacob Ball wasn't killed by the first shot. So Emil walked up to the boy, put his foot on his back, and shot Jacob through the neck at point-blank range. It's awful. Emil and Julius then dragged the bodies back inside and left while the house was consumed in flames. The motive for this awful crime? The Balls were once wards of the town. They were poor immigrants from the western part of what recently became known as Czechoslovakia. In 1909, East Haddam bought the family a shack of a house and a little bit of land to give them a fresh start and a chance to earn their own way. Now, the Balls lived too close to Emil Shute's house for his liking. They were undesirable. And at one point, Shute was trying to sell a piece of property near the Ball land and was chased off by a shotgun-holding Joseph Ball. So Shute never liked his new neighbors, and now they were a potential threat to his business deal. Yeah, exactly. And so the death of the Ball family were initially ruled a tragic accident, 
But after they were exhumed and the bullets were found, Emil Schutt was found guilty of their murders. He's sentenced to hang for four murders on October 22nd, 1922. His final words were, well, goodbye. And that brings us back to today. Shute was buried in an unmarked grave in Pine Grove Cemetery in Middletown. He represented himself in court, and he was described as firm and stoic even when his sentencing was read. He showed no emotion. But in his final six months, he grew desperate, writing letters, making appeals, and begging. None of it helped. Shute wasn't the last person to be hanged in Connecticut, but his story is remembered because he was a bad person all around. He killed one person over $100 and murdered an entire family because he just didn't like them. And today on maps, you'll see that the name of this hill is officially known as Cremation Hill. So there's truth to the legend. There is. As the story was told and retold, some people start to imply that Emil Schutt did this many times to different farmhands, that this was his M.O., to seek out workers from far away with no local connections, make them work for a season, kill them and burn them. Some say he did it over and over, a serial killer. But in truth, he did it once. Plus, he murdered some neighbors. Add in his nasty reputation and public execution, and a horrific legend is born. A legend that left a literal mark in the naming of this hill. And that brings us to After the Legend, where we take a deeper dive into this week's story, sometimes veer off course. After the Legend is brought to you by our Patreon patrons. Our Patreon patrons are the backbone of everything we do. Since the beginning, we asked for help with our mission, and our patrons answered that call. They help us with our hosting, our production costs, our marketing costs, everything else it takes to bring you a new story each and every week. It's just three bucks a month, and they get early access to new episodes, plus bonus episodes and content that no one else gets to hear. If you can help, please head over to patreon.com slash New England Legends to sign up. Oof. Brutal, huh? Sounds like a movie plot, to be honest with you. I mean, like a scary movie, like a real yeah. horror movie, a serial killer movie. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't, I don't know, like people were crazy back then. You sure. wouldn't expect it. I guess as much as because I think we see so many modern day horror movies, we don't think of people back then being like that. But I suppose monsters go way back. Of course they do. And so if you look through the news archives, um, you know, around these years, uh, all, all the Connecticut newspapers were talking about it because it was just it was brutal. Like this guy literally got away with murder until his kids ratted him out. Yeah. Um, and speaking of which, if you head to our website, you can click on episode 284. You can see some pictures um, from those old newspaper clippings and, you know, from the trial and things what like that. What did he look that. like? Um, you know, I, did he look scary? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he kind of did. And, and he represented himself in court. He fired his attorney um, and just figured he'd tell his story. I think this guy was just one of those people that was used to imposing his will on everyone around him. Right. So he, he was in a small town and his family were under his thumb. Uh, his wife was scared of him. He would rob you if, if that's what it took, kill you if that's what it took. And he got sued and didn't care. You know, yeah. he just sort of was like, whatever, I'm going to do what I do. And the interesting thing is, is how the narrative changes. Once he realized, like, the judge is sentencing him to death for for four murders, mm. right? You're going to die on this date. And back then, it wasn't years and years and decades before you got, it was months. Yeah. And so suddenly it sort of dawned on him, like, oh, no. They're going to do this. Maybe I should have fought harder. Well, Kept my lawyer. So he's writing letters saying, oh, come on. I always treated you fairly in business and so on. We should, you know, you should come to my aid here. But yeah. there's no aid you can come to. You've been sentenced by a jury of your peers. You already committed the crimes. Right. You know, you can't take that back. The interesting thing to me is that uh, his son, Julius, didn't get in any trouble. Um even though right. Julius was the star witness. But if, well, because he came forward. Right. And if dad's abusive, I, yeah. mean, I think that's a defense on his part. I know, but even if your dad's abusive and you, you literally set fire to someone's house. Yeah. Like, because yeah. he told you to. Um, I know. It's oof, rough. Um, but yeah, so the kids didn't get in any trouble. Um, although um, his, his, widow, his wife, widow, actually, did remarry. And his sons were in and out of trouble with the law pretty much the rest of their days. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, Followed in dad's footsteps. Pretty broken start. I yeah. Mean, what do you do, you know? Well, you think you'd uh, appreciate life a little bit more without crazy dad around. Yeah, just a horrible thing. So um, so when you go there today, you can look on the map. It says Cremation Hill. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a map name. It's not a street name. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, there's a few houses around that area and so on. 
but some yeah. ashes. Don't mess with those. <laughs> you, 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 I, I picture some neighbor, you know, burning brush that you do, you know, in the fall <laughs> or whatever. And someone's just like, oh, no, not again, you know? <laughs> it's back. It's back. Um, but, yeah, so many of these stories do read like a, a horrible movie plot. You know, you, I mean, my God, the what we just read right there could yeah. be, is is a, a scene at least yeah. from a horror movie. Just some some nasty, horrible patriarch that's just horrible to everybody. Well, what scared me the most was lighting the fire and then going around, like lighting the fire in the back and then waiting for them to run out the front hmm. and just taking them out as they come out. The, um, there was a line, and we didn't put it in there, but it was in the, the news coverage. Um, Julius said after they had dragged the bodies back into the house that was starting to burn. That they stood back and watched it for a minute. Ugh. And um, at one point, Emil Schutt said, that's pretty. Oh, my God. Yeah. And just so no remorse, no nothing. Just, I don't care. It's so calculated. Yeah. It's just, you know, I mean, they woke up early to do it. It wasn't an argument that turned into murder. Nope. It was like, yeah, let's get up, have some breakfast, yeah. and go kill the neighbors. Don't like these neighbors. Oh. This, this, I know how I'll get rid of them. Psychologically, that must have screwed up young Jacob. How do you have that lack of empathy? Like that much where, I mean, you know, if there's a neighbor you don't get along with, like you don't want to kill him. No. You, know? you, you send move. your dog over to poop in the yard. Yeah, right. <laughs> or uh, you move, right? Yeah, you move. Put or, up a fence. Yeah, yeah. So they built was, fences back then on their own, didn't they? They, you could. Yeah, yeah, you could for sure. So anyway, so it's, yeah, a real tragic story. And uh, one of those things where I, I imagine, you know, again, it's you have to look at a map to see that it's called Cremation Hill. Mm. It, no one uses it as a landmark. No one says, "Oh, make a left at Cremation Hill." Right, right. But if you did live around there and you did know, and you said, "Oh, hey, why do they call it Cremation Hill?" And then someone goes, "Oh, that's the farmer he used to live on that land and burn the bodies." It's probably a warning to children: don't go to Cremation Hill. Don't go to and it, and the thing Emma is, Emma will get you. So the legend's true. Yes, it got exaggerated over time that mm. he did this all the time. I mean, he did it to one person, but then also killed neighbors. I mean, right. terrible. But yeah, he was all over the papers. And uh, today we remember with a name of a hill. Please stay involved with us. We're a community of legend seekers. You should subscribe if you don't already because it's free wherever you get your podcast. Please post a review for us and tell a friend or two. Share our episodes on your social media. All of that goes a long way in helping the cause. We appreciate you. We very much do. We'd like to thank our sponsor, New Audio Herbals. We appreciate them as well. Thank you to our Patreon patrons, who we appreciate, and we appreciate John Judd for the music. Until next time, remember, the bazaar is closer than you think. Mm-hmm.